for those who are guests today and particularly uh, welcoming the Columbus Jewish Day School, Mamsh Mamshishkim. Am I saying it right? No, I'm not saying it right. Close, a little bit close. Thank you for the teens and adults who join us in your continued studies. That's the key, which is what the Hebrew means that I messed up. So we welcome you here. It's great to have you. And others who are with us today, friends and family that are here for this special Legacy Sunday, and a special welcome as well to uh, the nieces and family of Rick Sayer who are with us today. It is good to have you with us in worship as we remember him and hold him in our constant memory. One last thing before I preach today. Jennifer Fry, would you please stand up? And you all see this woman, she's behind me a little bit. Jennifer Fry is the director of our bell choir. She has transformed the sound and spirit of bells at First Church. And if it wasn't for you, we would not be here today. So thank you for this day and all you've given to us to make the bells beautiful. Again, and a special tribute uh, to you in thanksgiving for all you do. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In just a few days, our Jewish siblings will step into year 5785 as they celebrate on the eve of Rosh Hashanah this Wednesday night. The shofar will sound. In fact, I was in the fanning room earlier and it was in the house, so the shofar is nearby. The shofar will sound, the people will sing and pray, and the New Year's blessings will be exchanged, and hope will be born again. Coming out of a year in which war in Israel and Gaza and record incidents of anti-Semitism here in central Ohio, across Ohio, across the nation and the world have been hit, we have hit too many of our sisters and brothers in the Jewish community and with a deeply broken heart. I say I'm sorry to see this happen to you. And you know your family to me. This is, there is one whose story of courage and deliverance inspires us in all war-torn and terror-torn times. Her name is Queen. You guys are great. Queen Esther, right. In the little book of the Bible named for her, and I might point out, there are two books in the Bible named for women, Ruth and Esther, right? But you guys don't know this, but the Christian scriptures don't have any books named for women. Shame on us. We, we, we're missing the mark. Thank you to our Hebrew scriptures that tell us about the power of women's voices in scriptural studies. We hear her story, which has inspired the celebration of Purim, the Jewish people's festival of commemorating their survival from the plot to exterminate them in ancient Persia, now known as Iran. The story of Esther is a story of a miracle. It is a salvation story. Hiddenness is a central theme in this tale of valor and courage and liberation. All the heroes, Mordecai, Esther, and God, are hidden from view in various ways. Mordecai, the foster father of Esther, following her parents' death, is behind the scenes throughout this story, caring for, encouraging, organizing his people, and helping his foster daughter to understand what needs to be done. Esther becomes queen of Persia, and through her beauty cannot be hidden from view. Her identity as a Jewish woman is hidden from view from her new husband and the king. And then there is God. In this short story, when the Persian king is mentioned 190 times, God has this many mentions, zero. God is not mentioned in this story, which by the way, has caused scholars and theologians through the generations to be disturbed at times with Esther, right? This story, not her herself. God's very absence cries out for our attention. It is as though the writers and hearers of this story are winking at us and at each other saying, where's God? Just watch and see. 
while the activity of the alcoholic king who keeps getting suckered into many things is questionable and very public, and while the evil Haman, who seeks to destroy every single Jew in Persia, is carried on in plain sight, all the heroes, all the heroes of this story are hidden in plain view. Today, I will not tell the whole story of Esther and your fortunate, but I will tell you that you need to save the date of March 13th and 14th because in 2025, Purim falls on those days and it truly is one of the great days of partying and fun in synagogue and Jewish day schools near us. Esther's story might be one of the best known of Judaism, a story of salvation that always serves others while partying and joy serve at the center and everybody's having fun remembering Esther. In the heat of Haman's genocidal attempts against the Jews, Mordecai pens a note to his foster daughter, Esther. She doesn't think she can stop the destruction of the Jews by herself. As the queen, she's not sure of her capability. And he writes to her, he says to her, as she is hiding in plain sight and is silent at the moment, he writes to her to encourage her to remind her who she is and whose she is. These words in Esther 4.14 are immortal. Who knows, Mordecai writes, perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is so powerful. These words change Esther. And they change the steps that she takes. And the steps that she takes save her people. These words can apply to you and me. They can apply to every single person in every generation. Inspired by the book of Esther, there is a stone in the Washington Gladden Social Justice Park just outside our walls that asks the question for our children and the children of all generations. It asks, in, in every generation, God calls prophets. Will you be the one that God calls now to lead us in such a time as this? You see how her words reverberate and Mordecai's words keep coming to us? On the 172nd anniversary of our church's founding, the question before us today is how God has chosen us to stand up and to speak out and to be witnesses in such a time as this. It was the question that 27 women and 15 men answered in their time on this day, September 29, 1852, when they signed the charter and founded this congregation as the first white abolitionist congregation in Columbus, Ohio. Think about that. There were African-American churches at the time that were involved in this movement, but there were no white congregations involved. In 1850, the census said there were 8,848 people living in Columbus, Ohio. Only 42 of them who were Christians said that slavery was so wrong and so evil that they could not go another day of their lives without saying no and doing everything they can to worship and serve God for justice and liberation to change this way. They chose salvation while others chose a back seat and those who chose the back seat were saying that slavery was really okay at some level or another. Our forebears had the DNA of Esther in their souls. They stood up for justice in their generation at such a time as this. They too were hidden in plain sight until that monumental day. And the history of our church that has evolved since then is, since then is filled with gems of hidden history which grow into the fullness of faith and courage as we see it through the generations. I want to share a few of those gems in our own history with the hiddenness that has happened in our church in plain sight for a long time. First, abolitionists, as you know, and forgive me if, you sound, if I sound like I'm man speaking, just give me a break here for one second. Abolitionists believe that one person could not allow another person to be owned, right? They fought slavery in every single way. They fought to abolish slavery on this earth forever. In Columbus, our 42 were also involved in the Underground Railroad movement. So our members not only were fighting on the big screen, on the big scale, but they were fighting by hiding runaway slaves. And we were also spies. 
This is very cool. First Congregational Church had spies for members. I love this part of our story. We sat on Capitol Square and reported to the Underground Railroad Movement where bounty hunters and federal troops were moving to capture slaves that were trying to run away to Canada, okay? And so they, it allowed the slaves to hide better and stay one step ahead of their violent pursuers. We were hiding in plain sight, right down on Capitol Square. Esther and Mordecai would have loved us, and they would have stuck with this band of believers. During the Civil War, our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Edwin Goodwin, could be found at Fort Hayes, ministering to and caring for the soldiers preparing for the war. And then he could be found in the field hospitals with the wounded soldiers returning from war. But he was also present to the Confederate troops who were prisoners of war at Camp Chase. He took a lot of criticism from the members of First Church for doing this, for caring for the enemies. And why? Because these were the men that were killing their sons in battle, right? And yet he was firm in his belief that you have to love your enemy, as Jesus said, just as you love your friends. So he did this. And when President Lincoln was assassinated, Mary Todd Lincoln reached out to Pastor Goodwin and asked that he be one of two speakers when her husband's body came to Columbus to lie in state at the state capitol, which was across from our church at the time. On April 29, 1865, there were 100,000 people, 100,000 people gathered at the state capitol to remember President Lincoln in a town with a population of 18,500. Later, Dr. Goodwin led that service, and later at the invitation of the White House, he attended the trial of the conspirators who assassinated President Lincoln and wrote how they needed to work this through for the future of the nation. Another hidden history. The members of First Church were not just committed to freeing slaves, they were committed to caring for all people. In 1886, five women of First Church leased a 12-room home for homeless girls, and it was the beginning of the YWCA in Columbus. Six years later, these same women and others in the congregation opened Children's Hospital in 1892, which has grown to be one of the largest in Ohio and ranks among the top five nationwide. In 1900, our member Dr. James Baldwin opened Grant Hospital, and by 1904, Grant was the largest private hospital in the world, in the world, with a bed count of 303 beds. Grant is now, as we know, the top level one trauma center for Central Ohio. We also started the Godman Guild, the Gladden Community House, and helped begin seven churches, including First Community Church, Dublin Community Church, North Congregational, and Advent Community Church. In the 1800s, we sent more people from this church into foreign mission than any congregation in any denomination anywhere in Ohio. That's amazing. In addition to providing support for 55 years to the Neighborhood Nursery School, which was founded in 1947, First Church also founded and provided support for the Columbus Metropolitan School in 1969. The school was intended as an attempt to provide an educational experience along with innovative lines for the student body of all social, economic, racial, geographic, and religious parts of the community. It was a school that grew so fast that when it opened with 60 kids, five to seven years old in 1970, it had to move shortly after because it had outgrown its space. Each school was a beacon of light during the civil rights movement. And the founding of Bethlehem on Broad Street here 35 years ago came about for a, from a question that was asked. Who's going to feed me on Christmas Day? people of First Church stood right up and said, we'll take care of that. And it has been a community witness ever since. With the ministry of Washington Gladden, there are lots of hidden gems in the course of his 32 years as our pastor. The one that I love is that he had no formal theological training. I'm going to say that again. Dr. Washington Gladden had no formal theological training, but by the end of his ministry, he had 36 
count them, 36 honorary doctorates, 35, excuse me, I added one, 35 honorary doctorates from including Oxford and Cambridge, I mean, one couldn't give it without the other one, and Harvard and Yale, again, one couldn't do it without the other one. So, and probably all the institutions we know and love too. It's amazing. Just with a bachelor's degree, he ended up with 35 honorary doctorates in theology. Let's pause with that. Nominated by President Rutherford B. Hayes, Washington Gladden would have become the president of the Ohio State University, except for grudges that were nurtured by the board of directors against him because he made prophetic stands defending Roman Catholics from the demagogic assault that they faced from Billy Sunday and others, and because he questioned John D. Rockefeller's wasting tainted money from Standard Oil on others. So he was voted out unanimously. Later, he was said to have commented, that's all right, First Church pays me so well, I'm just fine. That was a laugh line. <laughs> Thank you. Another, another that I will share is his leadership of the Franklin County delegation of the Ohio Constitution Convention in 1911. This is a real hidden gem. The, each of the 88 counties of Ohio came to the convention. Franklin County, which was chaired by him, um, brought 400 changes to the Constitution. And you could only imagine there were commas and periods and things like that missing among the 400. But two of the proposals that were rejected, wait, one that made it, was the decision to put on the ballot a way that you could add to the Constitution by statewide ballot issues, which we just saw last fall, okay? So you could add something to the Constitution for Ohio based on the voters' rights. But the two proposals that 87 counties, except for Franklin County, rejected were that women would have the right to vote, all women, and that the end of the death penalty would begin immediately. This is 1911. We came that close on each one, right? Because Gladden was at the heart of it. So there's some amazing things. If you want other gems, you're gonna to have to get me aside for like two or three hours, or read Jacob Dorn's biography on Gladden, or wait for my book to come out. Here's some other hidden history gems as we finish. The tons of stone which hold our Gothic beauty together were quarried 500 miles southeast of here in southeast Pennsylvania and shipped by trains from the quarry in Neshaminy, Pennsylvania. That's right, we had trains that came into Columbus. The building was built to the memory of Washington Gladden, so between Cleveland Avenue and 9th Street today, Gladden's name and honor is upheld on this entire block where we have the Social Justice Park, the only one in America named for him. So here's some tidbits. And thanks to the amazing work of our late archivist emeritus, Rick Sayer, who, by the way, spent 20 years getting our archives back from the Ohio History Connection because he was smooth and kind and sweet. He talked them into giving everything back that we had given to them and they owned and held as their own. Thanks be to God for Rick in so many ways. And his successors and colleagues, David Mailer and Greg Duncan. We have an amazing amount of information on this house that Justice built, this Cathedral of Grace. But I want to share this last one. Celebrated architect of our 1931 structure, John Russell Pope, designed or modified many structures in the US and abroad during his career. And by the way, the guy who built this church on the ground was Dwight Smith, who built Ohio Stadium. And don't give me an OH yet. In addition to the well-known works, the Jefferson Memorial, the National Gallery of Art, the East Building, First Congregational Church, he remodeled the New York City home of Henry Clay Frick, which houses today the Frick Collection, and added a library. He added the Roosevelt Building, named for Theodore Roosevelt, to the Museum of Natural History in New York City. He designed the home of William K. Vanderbilt II, which became the headquarters of the Consulate General of Romania in New York. And outside of New York and Washington, he designed plans for a number of campuses, including Yale University, Johns Hopkins, Syracuse, and Dartmouth College. And he built our church. From Esther to this present day, 
we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, by people who have answered the challenge. Perhaps you have been chosen for such a time as this. And in these hidden histories, there is one presence which we cannot hide any longer. It is the presence of God. In each of these people who saw the future with hope, who fought through oppression as they faced it, God was working in them. And now I pray that our God, who is hiding in plain sight, might bless Caroline and Holden and might bring every one of us to know the gifts that are growing inside of us all. Thanks be to God for this church and for your ministry.